Hello and welcome to the Political History of the United States, Episode 3.2, The Waiting Game. 1689 had been a hugely influential and event-packed year for the colonies. Over the course of that year, the events taking place in England had spread to their English colonies across the Atlantic and had expressed itself as a series of rebellions. The colonists did the best they could to justify their actions as being in support of their new monarchs, William and Mary. However, for the colonists, this opened up a new and often difficult era. Suddenly, old enemies and rivalries were restored amid a changing political landscape. As this is going on, back in England, William and Mary were forced to consider what to do with the rebellious North American colonies. This week, we are going back to look at the period of years between the rebellions of 1689 and William III's decision of what to do with the colonies that would come in 1691. We are going to continue to look at the fight to justify to England why the rebellions occurred in the first place. We are likewise going to look at the internal affairs of Massachusetts during this period, as the Puritans desperately tried to figure out a way to regain their former control over the colony. And then finally, an interesting look at the Massachusetts economy and the introduction of paper currency. The events of 1689 were a pragmatic response to the glorious revolution back in England. The colonists had an opening to overthrow governments that they viewed as being arbitrary and abusive to their rights, and they went ahead and took the opportunity presented to them. For our new monarchs back in England, they were presented with a difficult question on how to deal with their wayward colonists. We have talked at length about all of the declarations by the colonists and the justifications for what their actions had been. At a most basic level, the colonists pointed out that they were not rebelling against England, but rather against despotic agents of a now-ousted James II. Amongst the most popular arguments by the colonists was an appeal to those anti-Catholic sentiments that were running throughout England at the time. And there is something to back this up. Especially in Maryland, which had been a Catholic colony, however, elsewhere as well, we see that there is constant talk about freedoms from the Catholic Church. Indeed, in the Declaration of the Gentlemen in Massachusetts, they directly refer to how William III had saved them from popery and slavery. The slavery that they are talking to is not literal slavery, but rather it is subjugation under the Pope. For the colonists, this is something of a low hanging fruit to grab for. After all, the events back in England had been to oust the Catholic James II in exchange for the Anglican William III. It makes sense that they would frame their rebellion as rescuing the colonies from the exact thing that William himself allegedly stood for. Well, the debate that they were overthrowing a potential Catholic government for their king was certainly a practical justification that connected the events of 1689 to the events of that winter back in England. For the colonists, it was concerns over the arbitrary nature of government on the eve of the Glorious Revolution that caused most of the internal strife. Nowhere were these complaints louder than in New England. Recall that last season we had talked about the land seizure plan under Andros in New England, the amount of anger that flowed throughout the colony. Suddenly, plots of land that had been controlled by a single family for decades required a petition to the king for the family to stay on that land. This is to say nothing of the dissolution of the local assembly or the fact that virtually all power now vested in a single individual. Representative assemblies were not a thing that were wholly unique to the American colonies, but were rather something that were common throughout England in regards to local governance. Being denied that basic representation was anathema to everything that the colonists felt that they were due. Last time, when we looked at the events that took place in Maryland, we see much of the same things taking place. The colonists had been nearly completely subjugated by the Catholic proprietors. We see these grievances most coherently put together by both Massachusetts and Maryland through their declarations where they call out the arbitrary rule that was proliferating in their colonies. Well, this was such a central issue, I'm not going to rehash all of this because we have already spent multiple episodes on it. By this point, we have dug deeply into the issue and I feel confident that we have given it justice. The question, therefore, moving forward is not a discussion about what the causes of the rebellion in 1689 in the English North American colonies were, but rather, how was that packaged up to the crown, and how was the crown going to respond? 
beginning first with the justification of the rebellions being to stop a broader Catholic conspiracy. This argument is always going to be the most palatable take for William III. William had indeed invaded England in the first place to dispose the Catholic James II and stop him from building a Catholic dynasty in England. However, that second question as to the arbitrary government was always going to be a much tougher road for him to follow. The question had been rumbling around for a while. However, immediately following 1689, the king was going to be forced to address the rights of the colonists in North America. In the eyes of the colonists, they were part of England. Sure, they knew that they lived in the colonies, but they did not view the North American colonies as being something that was distinct from England itself. There was not England and her colonies, but rather a singular country that they were part of. From the perspective of the colonists, this makes sense and logically follows. The colonists were not a conquered people, being controlled by a hostile England. Their immigration to North America was completely voluntary. This, therefore, was not some kind of exile, but rather this was something that they had chosen to do. It would only make sense that when they made their decision to extend the English Empire, they were not going to waive their rights as Englishmen in order to do it. Beyond declarations to the fact, New England and Massachusetts in particular relied heavily on the work of Increase Mather, who was in London while all of this was going down. He would become the primary agent for the colonies. Mather argued that the English needing to seek the dissolution of the charters of New England through the courts, utilizing Quo Warranto, served as proof that the colonies were in fact part of England. His basic argument boiling down to one of jurisdiction rather than justification. If the colonies were not part of England, then the courts would have lacked the jurisdiction to prosecute the Quo Warranto claim against the colonial charters. This means, according to Mather, that the real incursion of rights had been the appointment of Andros, who was sent from England with the specific purpose of interfering with the colonists' rights as Englishmen. While Mather was speaking specifically about the situation in New England, this sentiment was shared throughout the colonies. In Maryland, John Coot was just as anxious to see rights extended to the population and taken out of the hands of the proprietors. In New York, it was the same story with Jacob Leisler, who wrote that in New York, they had long lived under the same restrictions and difficulties as those in England, those same people who had been liberated by King William and Queen Mary. Beyond all else, the justification for the rebellions was that the colonists were simply emulating what they had seen in England, and really, practical considerations do seem to support this view. Well, sure there had undoubtedly been some angry rumbling for years in taverns, we cannot dismiss the fact that there has been no evidence of a greater movement prior to them actually doing anything in April of 1689, right as the rumors became increasingly impossible to ignore that something had happened back in England with James II. In that sense, the rebellions of 1689 exist because the opportunity presented itself and not because of a greater pre-planned movement against the crown. This is further supported by looking at the fact that the evidence suggests that in Maryland, they were not even aware of the events in the North with New England or New York. This means that Coode's rebellion was undertaken completely independently, not just in execution, but in thought as well. They were not pulling influence from their Northern brethren. How the colonies followed up on the events of the rebellion further support that the real outcome that they sought in the aftermath of 1689 was a return to the status quo of five years earlier, at least as it related to New England. To quote the historian David Lovejoy, whose book The Glorious Revolution in America has been an absolutely invaluable asset to me over the past dozen or so episodes, he says, the glorious revolution in the colonies was less an attempt to kick over the traces and strive for a brave new world in America than it was to return to an acceptable conception of empire which the colonists earlier had lived with or had lived for in the past. This quote so completely summarizes the ultimate goals and aims of the glorious revolution in the colonies. So much of this rebellion, with Maryland really standing as an exception, 
was not progressive in any means. It was a backwards-looking rebellion attempting to restore a condition that had at least been acceptable to the colonists. Ultimately, the problem, however, is that being a backwards-looking rebellion isn't going to be sufficient throughout the Dominion of New England. No matter how much they wished they could go back in time, and this is specifically in Massachusetts, that Puritan hegemony that had so dominated politics for the last 60 years was broken, and it was not coming back. Looking specifically at Massachusetts, which had been at the center of everything when it came to the overthrow of Andros and the Dominion, it found itself entering immediately into a new era. The 1689 Boston Rebellion had not been an event led by any single individual nor a specific group. Moderates and old guard Puritans alike were forced to put down old rivalries in the interest of the perceived greater good. This is going to force two groups that had absolutely no love for each other to address the reality that they were now stuck having to move forward together. This is not to say that the Puritans didn't do what they could to regain their former position of power. What emerged was an uncomfortable situation where the Puritans pretended that life was back to normal. Well, the moderates reminded them that that was just not the case. The practical effect of this is that following the overthrow of Andros, a legislative logjam formed in the Massachusetts Assembly and partisan bickering became the defining feature of those years. One of the problems that emerged in Massachusetts following April of 1689 is that the events had progressed so rapidly that nobody really ever got around to asking the question of what should we do next? Should Andros and the Dominion of New England be brought down? Well, okay, yeah, that's a great idea. But nobody really asked the question of what do we do once it is? It did not make matters any easier that there was no one person or group that led the charge against the Dominion. It was a group effort. This means that following the brief moment of cooperation, all of those old problems immediately returned, with the exception being that the moderates were far less willing to be subjugated by the Puritan faction. Furthermore, let's not look past the fact that Andros, as unpopular as he was, did not have universal hatred in the colonies. Anglicans, for example, viewed Andros as having done much to improve their position. They may not have agreed necessarily with his land or taxation policies. However, he did bring an end to state-sponsored persecution in Massachusetts. Prior to Andrus, the Anglicans in the colony were shoved to the margins of society. Denied the sacrament and generally denied an opportunity to worship, Andros had brought with him an ability to freely practice their religion. The Anglicans inside of New England had zero interest in being put back into a position where they were denied the freedom of worship. This group was practicing the official religion of England, and they greatly feared a return to the original charter. Just as problematic is that the moderates, largely made up of the merchant class, also was in opposition about the reconfirmation of the pre-1686 charter. Remember that it was the moderates who originally were in favor of Andros, as he would be able to break up the Puritan stranglehold that they all despised. Circumstances had forced them to work with the Puritan faction to overthrow Andros, yes. However, none of them wanted to return to the old charter and again see their rights denied because of the ruling Puritan class. For the old government, their animosity towards the Anglicans was not exactly a secret. We spent an entire episode, that be episode 2.25 if you're curious, discussing the religious reforms that Andros brought with him to the Dominion. If you recall, the Puritans had done all they could to interfere with the introduction of an Anglican church within the colony. Andros, despite acting nicely, made clear that his requests were mere formality and that Anglicanism would be accepted in the colony. This included the construction of a church, specifically King's Chapel, in the middle of Boston, right on top of a Puritan cemetery. The church became something of a symbol of the rising power of Anglicans in New England. The Puritans did in fact take out their frustrations upon the Anglicans. The church was repeatedly vandalized, and they faced continued harassment by the Puritans. 
Anglicans by this point made up a large portion of society inside of Massachusetts. By the time that 1690 rolled around, they made up thousands of people. These thousands of people would have remained far more in line with what was the stated position of the crown rather than the ruling Puritans back in New England. Beyond that, William III himself would have become the head of the Anglican Church. For the Puritans, therefore, the Anglicans, despite the fact that they were still in a position where the Puritan elite could limit their influence, posed a very significant concern and threat to the continued power of the Puritan leadership. Well, the Puritans were able to basically pick up where they left off in 1686. The most key difference is that they were now acting with a vulnerability that they had previously not known. As we see with the example of the Anglican Church, there are a lot of people inside of Massachusetts who have zero interest in seeing a reconfirmation of the former charter. With the Puritans suddenly dealing with the potential that, despite their apparent victory over Andros, they may be in danger of losing their stranglehold on Massachusetts, what emerges is a colony that was becoming increasingly paranoid. Not only were they concerned about their ability to maintain their power long term, but they were immediately concerned about the amount of power and influence that they had at that very moment. What therefore emerges is a potentially vulnerable group that is now acting with an element of paranoia. The Puritan faction saw challenges to their authority everywhere and recognized the necessity to crack down on any kind of dissension. This would manifest itself largely through control in the press. By the end of 1690, local printer Benjamin Harris founded a newspaper. In fact, it was Boston's first paper. The paper, called Public Occurrences, proved to be painfully short-lived. Following the first issue, the paper was banned in light of not having secured a proper license to publish. However, the more interesting note came from the colonist Samuel Sewell. Sewell mentioned that the banning of the paper also had to do with the fact that it contained an article that was critical of the government. Cotton Mather would write during this incident a letter making clear that at the present time, Massachusetts wasn't in a place where they could support a newspaper, especially one that was critical of the government. This is a very direct example of the Puritan leadership trying to get a hold over any kind of dissension that flowed through the colony. Now, a quick note on Samuel Sewell. He does deserve a more proper introduction, as he is going to be an interesting figure, who is going to appear a few times in our story, beginning in our upcoming episodes on the Salem Trials. Today, his role in our episode is more akin to a footnote, so we will give him a more proper introduction in a few episodes' time. So, if you're just a gigantic fan of Samuel Sewell and you've listened to the past 65 episodes just waiting to get to him, just go ahead and consider today a teaser. We'll get to him here shortly. In another example of the rampant concern running through the Massachusetts Assembly came when Francis Nicholson sent a letter north to Massachusetts to get a sense of what was going on there. Recall that Nicholson was last seen noping out of New York when Jacob Leisler decided to rebel. For his trouble, he got a stern look and a promotion to become the lieutenant governor of Virginia, something that we're also going to talk about here in the future. Nicholson sent an agent to carry correspondence to Massachusetts, with permission to travel given directly from Governor Bradstreet. Despite this, however, the agent was harassed. Many of his correspondences were seized, and generally he was just given a pretty bad time by the assembly. We can glean a couple of important points out of this. First, it is impossible to dismiss the fact that the letters being sent from Francis Nicholson helped absolutely nothing at all. He had been a big part in the Dominion government, and while he was not vilified to the same extent as Andros, Nicholson was not exactly a beloved figure either, and he was indeed as deeply unpopular as you might imagine. However, regardless of the agent being from Nicholson, this incident shows just how concerned the government of Massachusetts really was at this point. Just as they were attempting to control the flow of information by limiting the press, they were extremely protective of private correspondence coming into the colony as well. This gives the appearance that, rather than being confident in the grip of power, the government of Massachusetts realized just how tenuous a hold they had. The fact that Bradstreet had given permission for the letters to be delivered gives insight into his power. It is obvious from this that he was not in total command over his government, 
and that the events may have slipped past him as well. We would get another tidbit from this episode that is worth noting. Nicholson's agent wrote of the general dissatisfaction with the Puritan government in Massachusetts, and goes on to mention that the colony was back to its old ways of totally blowing off the navigation acts. Of course, we probably should take this with a grain of salt because, you know, the guy had just been harassed by the Puritans, but it is still worth noting. There are other examples as well, especially in regards to those who have been close to Andros. Colonist Thomas Graves, for example, refused to recognize the government in Massachusetts, claiming that the charter had not been restored and that they had no right to govern without the express permission of the king and queen. Having none of it, the Puritan government did make overtures towards wanting to arrest Graves. However, this attempt was stymied when his friends made clear that any such act would result in them destroying the jail itself. Graves would ultimately not be arrested and would in fact write to the king, expressing how unnecessary the revolution in Massachusetts had actually been. The takeaway from all of this is that in Boston during that period between the fall of Edmund Andros and the king's decision on what to do about the colonial charter, things were not actually back to business as usual. The Puritan faction in the colony did everything they could to do to maintain power. However, events and realities made them far more paranoid of a group than we had seen in 1686. Despite all of their efforts, their grip on power was no longer as strong as it had been before Andros. The Puritans did in fact have a lot to worry about, and maintaining order was critical. Despite appearing to be back in control, they understood that they were merely running what may amount to an interim government. They all knew that eventually William III would take action on the colony. All the Puritans could do at this point is hope that such action would not result in them forever losing their grip of their city upon the hill. I want to wrap today up by taking a look at the economy in Massachusetts in the period between the fall of the Dominion and the granting of a new charter, specifically in relation to the creation of paper money. I'm going to confess to you guys, this was really not my intention with this episode. However, it is a topic that I stumbled upon while researching this episode and thought that it was really fascinating. This seemed like the most logical point to fit in what I read about, so for the rest of today, I'm going to fill you all in on the rabbit hole that I've gone tumbling down. Following King Philip's War, the economy of New England had been in disarray. The coming of Edmund Andros and the Dominion of New England had done little to improve the situation. When Andros was overthrown, if you'll recall, one of the things that he had been dealing with was Indian attacks up in Maine. In fact, that was what had kept him out of the colony and likely aided the buildup to the events of April 18th. Despite Puritan claims that the entire incident in Maine was some kind of a Catholic conspiracy, the truth is that there was ongoing warfare up there, and that the Abenaki Indians were indeed supported by the French. The result of this is that the northern border of the colonies was very insecure and required defending. With Andros gone, the assembly back in Boston was suddenly in a place where they were going to need to deal with the threats along the border. The job of doing that fell to Sir William Phipps. Born in Maine in 1651, Phipps was trained to be a shepherd. Phipps, however, proved to have very little interest in shepherding and dreamed of adventure and riches. This quest would drive him to England where he and two other men, and don't worry about their names, entered into a salvage company together. Phipps was able to secure a lease of an English Navy ship and set sail to the Caribbean to look for treasure. As an interesting note, the first job for Phipps on his new ship was to transport a passenger to New England before he made his way south to the Caribbean. The passenger? Well, that would be Edward Randolph carrying a copy of the Quo Warranto to Massachusetts from episode 2.23. Phipps would prove to have great success in the Caribbean and discovered the remains of the Conception, a trading ship that had sunk with a huge amount of silver on board. This find was one of the biggest of the century. William Phipps became a celebrity and also became Sir William Phipps, making him the first New Englander to be knighted. And his customary percentage of the find made him a very, very wealthy man. However, following a few more journeys that were far less successful and the death of a few close allies back in England, the now rich William Phipps returned to New England and settled down in Boston. Originally, Phipps had been given the job of helping run the system of sheriffs in the Dominion government. 
However, he never seemed to get along well with either Andros or Randolph. Seeing that Phipps was not getting along very well with Andros, the Mathers spotted an opportunity and quickly brought him into their church. When Increase Mather escaped to London, he was soon joined thereafter by Phipps, who spent time working with him as an agent. Phipps was sent back to Boston with information confirming the overthrow of James II in 1689, but by the time he reached Boston, they had already heard the rumors and gotten rid of Andros by themselves. With Andros gone, however, the problems to the north with the Abenaki remained, and the job of eliminating the threat belonged to Phipps, based on his naval experience during the time as a salvage operator. The plan was a dual assault on Port Royal, part of modern-day Nova Scotia, and Quebec. Phipps scored a decisive victory in Port Royal. However, he fared far more poorly in Quebec, where he suffered an embarrassing loss. With his men dying and the victory at Port Royal, the decision was made that the northern borders were at least secure enough for everybody to just go back home. Though he was undoubtedly thrilled to have helped lessen the risk along the borders, plus pretty pleased to have helped grow the empire through conquest, Phipps did have a problem. The entire expedition had been very, very expensive. Making matters worse is that there was now no money to pay the considerable debt that Massachusetts held. Cotton Mather had reported that the colony's debts were now in excess of 40,000 pounds without any money in the treasury to pay back those debts. With the treasury empty and the creditors demanding payments for their assistance, the colonists had a very serious problem on their hands. People wanted money, and the colony had zero to give. Needing to do something, the provincial government turned to the idea that had worked well across the Atlantic in Venice. Chiefly, they were going to issue paper currency. When attempted in Venice, the issuance of paper currency followed a plan where the currency was originally backed by silver. What the Venetians found, however, is that in a relatively short amount of time, the value of the currency exceeded the amount of silver backing it. This was made possible because people using the paper currency were not investing just in silver, but rather were investing in the confidence in the credit of the state itself. The obvious problem here is that Massachusetts was not Venice. However, Massachusetts really had very little choice. They had no silver in which to secure the paper money. Furthermore, they couldn't turn to the old standby of land as a way to guarantee the money. Land was historically a way that paper currency could be secured, especially if precious metals alone proved to be insufficient. However, recall that Edmund Andros had overturned all the land claims in Massachusetts early on during his time as the Dominion governor. Now, while practically speaking, the colonists wanted to ignore this completely, the fact remained that the government was unsettled in 1690. Sure, there was hope that everything would end up reverting back to its pre-1686 condition. However, that was far from guaranteed. Should William III not overturn all of the programs of Andros, the risk remained that the land used to back the currency would no longer exist. Therefore, the currency's only value was going to have to come in the form of confidence in the colony and their interim government. Now, the problem for Massachusetts is they could not simply issue paper money. The government was in a fight to get their charter restored, and one of the most common complaints in the colony was that they were already debasing their money. Paper currency would, in essence, be completely debased as there was nothing actually backing it in the first place. This isn't something that was going to help a colony fighting for its political life endear itself to England. Issuing paper currency itself would have felt a lot like another show of defiant autonomy that had caused the colony so many problems in the first place. The government, therefore, needed to figure out a way to issue paper currency that was backed only by confidence in the government, while at the same time making sure that it did not actually look like a form of currency. The solution that they came up with was to make the currency appear to be an IOU from the colonial government. Without going into all of the requirements, as it is not really necessary to know them all, IOUs had very specific requirements under English law. The currency was therefore carefully distinguished to meet all five of those requirements, at least in theory, if not so much as in reality. In this specific situation, appearances were critical. 
that cash needed to appear as an IOU, and at least on paper, this is exactly what they were. In this fashion, should England come around asking questions about why their colony had unilaterally decided to issue paper money, the colonists could correct them. Paper currency? Oh, there is none of that here. Just these IOUs being issued by a broke colonial government. See, IOUs, not paper currency. Nothing more to see here. This new paper currency, masquerading of course as an IOU, was distributed and could be used to pay down debts, specifically in relation to taxes. It also did not hurt that amongst the biggest backers of the currency was William Phipps, who was a very wealthy man. While not sounding like much, Phipps as a backer helped give legitimacy to the entire system. So how did the entire thing work out? The end result of the introduction of paper money in Massachusetts is mixed. The fact that the government accepted the currency as payment for tax debt did help as that became a common avenue of exchange within the colony. This did, of course, little to help out the underlying lack of funds in the treasury of the colony. However, pragmatically speaking, the fact that the government was willing to accept the paper currency did help convince those looking at payment in the currency that it did indeed have value. It acted to boost confidence in the new paper money. Despite this, nearly immediately upon its release, the currency lost approximately one-third of its value. In order to prop up the currency, the wealthy in the colony gave up some of their own silver in exchange for paper currency. Likewise, there was a sense of desperation in the colony. The paper currency was largely being given to the troops who had fought in Maine. These men depended on the payments just to survive. Despite the initial loss of value, these men had few other options. They needed the payments, the colony was lacking in silver to make said payments, therefore they had little else they could do. Colonists could either hold out for a possible payment in silver at some undetermined time in the future, or they could accept paper money now, despite that one-third devaluation. Hunger and desperation drove events, and in addition to the new wealthy colonists' attempts, the bleeding stopped, and the currency at least stabilized. Paper currency is going to remain a part of life in Massachusetts for a long while to come. Within a few years' time, it would come to be a viable substitute for colonists paying their taxes rather than traditional payments in silver or in grain. There will be some changes following 1692, after William III finally got around to deciding the fate of the colony. However, for the time being at least, this unique experiment in the use of paper currency had helped save the colony from a financial disaster. Next time, we are going to conclude our series on the Glorious Revolution. Beginning last season with our episodes on the Dominion of New England, we have spent a lot of time moving through the events of the Glorious Revolution in North America. Next time, we are going to bring that story arc to an end as we see what William III is going to decide to do in regards to the colonies, as well as take stock of why the Glorious Revolution is such a key turning point in the history of the colonies. Until then, I hope you all have a wonderful two weeks, that you are staying healthy, and that you are staying safe. And I will see you back here in two weeks' time as we wrap up our story on the Glorious Revolution. <laughs>